Thanks so much for joining me for this week's episode of When I Grow Up. On today's episode, it is my pleasure to introduce you and welcome to the podcast, Esther Kim. Hi, Esther. How are you? I'm good, Blair. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for meeting with me on this evening. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, Well, I know that you're probably super busy. So me, I'm just thankful for the time and the space. And I'm excited to hear about what you do um, for a living. So let's jump right to it, if you don't mind. I'm ready. Okay, yeah. So can you tell me, Esther, what is it that you do? So in a nutshell, I get asked this question a lot, and I always try to define it in different ways. But the simplest way I've learned to kind of share what I do, um, I would say I'm a career matchmaker. Mm. So (laughs) what that means is um, I have the opportunity to align really talented individuals uh, with their career objectives um, and what they want to do um, to companies' openings, right? Mm-hmm. So um, currently, and at my past company, I get to recruit for my organization. So kind of putting those puzzle pieces together is is what I get to do. Wow, that's like um, a, a job that I feel like I um, don't think about much. But also, it's like interesting because I feel like you would have to have a certain gifting in seeing people's like resumes and talking to them and kind of understanding like, oh, maybe you would be good for this position. Mm. Is, is that right? Am I yes. That? Yeah, you nailed it for sure. And mm-hmm. um, it's, so it's a little bit of I love doing like jigsaw puzzles. It's almost like that, right? You're like, ah, oh, this fits better here or this could align better here. So Definitely. Um, yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> wow. Okay. So like, I have so many questions. But first, <laughs> um, I feel like this is going to be a really valuable uh, interview, you guys. I'm going to like ask her because she's a recruiter, essentially, for for people looking for jobs. And I feel like, you know, this podcast in itself, like, that's kind of the point. <laughs> like, like, you know, yeah. finding your match, you know, and finding, you know, and understanding that there are so many different jobs out there um but specifically i know you were mentioning before we started uh the recording that uh you work for an it consulting firm is that correct correct could you elaborate on that a little bit yeah absolutely so currently i'm in week two of my current company so i'm still just training and learning but um, i currently work for slalom They are a local consulting firm focusing around technology, business transformation, and strategy work um, Mm. here in Atlanta. They're headquartered in St. Louis. Um, And prior to that, I was actually at another consulting firm for a little over six years um, in the recruiting space, hiring for that consulting company, um, as well as leading a a recruiting, like a small recruiting team. Wow. Okay. So... um... Again, excuse my ignorance, but um, like, how is that different? Is that different than HR, like hiring and stuff? Yeah, good question. So um, I love this question because when I uh, first was looking into this field or coming right out of school and what do I want to do? Um, I didn't know much about it myself, right? So um, we're not HR per se, but we partner with that, right? Okay, so yes. um, the HR group may do more functions of kind of, um, you know, uh, your benefits, your payroll, um, you know, the the legal side of hiring, mm-hmm. letting people go, onboarding, new hire paperwork, all of that. And the recruiting leg, the talent acquisition side is more kind of um, the beginning part of the process, right? Aligning candidates and helping them potentially get through the entire interview process, extending an offer, and then kind of passing that baton along Mm, over to HR. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does a typical day look like for you, Esther? So I'll say this, um, in the space that I've been in, um, it definitely takes someone that is a self-starter. My workday is it really varies um, per day, every day, right? So um, there's a lot of autonomy. Um, so you need to be very organized. And for me, that was something that I had to learn 
because there was not, hey, during this window, this is what you need to do. And then at this window, this is what you need to do. You were kind of owning your desk, right? Mm -hmm. And it's basic economics in the sense where the more you put in, potentially the more you're going to get out of it. Right. And so I, um, from when I first started in this space, you know, I did schedules <laughs> for myself so that a, I stayed organized, but B um, I had a game plan of what I wanted to accomplish in that day. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I mapped out a part of my day where I was sourcing, which means that you're going and hunting for candidates, right. Um, maybe sending emails, calling them, texting them, which, you know, is like the modern way of, of maybe recruiting these days. And then another segment is dedicated time to do interviews, right? You're interviewing candidates. So um, I would interview them over the phone pre-COVID. Um, I would interview them in person. Um, and then another leg of my kind of day is facilitating any leadership interviews, any technical interviews, and making sure that kind of takes place and, and, and organized. And then um, the remaining two areas in my past role was, you know, leading, managing, and mentoring a team, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also on top of that, um, the meetings that are just comes up um, throughout a typical work day. And then a big area that I made sure I try to fit into my week or my day is learning. Um, just for my own personal growth and development. So I wanted to be a better recruiter. I wanted to keep up with, you know, current market trends. I wanted to keep up with hiring trends. I wanted to make sure I knew enough about, you know, diversity, inclusion, and and being equitable, right? Um, And so these were things that I dedicated um, every week, a little bit of time um, for just my own personal growth. I see. Wow. That sounds like a very full day. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It is. It definitely Um, is. Some days aren't that hectic and busy, but um, a lot of days, yeah, it feels like you're running around spinning like all these different plates at the same time. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, well, like something that comes to mind is like, I, you know, I... I've actually never been through a hire. I guess I have once, but like, um, like a hiring process, really. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I, there was no need for it for, for what I do or what I was trying to do at post college. Sure. Um, but you know, like, are these IT consulting uh, companies that you work for? Like, so they're constantly looking for people. Yeah, good question. So thankfully, that's created kind of job security for me. I see. Um, when I was at my last company, being there a little over six years, um, I hired probably the bulk of that period, uh, minus kind of halts here and there based on hiring demand shifts and changes, especially what happened last year during COVID. I don't think any company was kind of prepared for that. Mm-hmm. And it was something that I think a lot of different organizations um, had to adapt. Mm-hmm. And so there were parking kind of um, of hiring, right? Mm-hmm. And then we had to help out in kind of other ways. But generally, yes, you know, I always say recruiting is is kind of ebbs and flows, right? Um, mm-hmm. Where there's big hiring demand and push and other times it may not be as much. So you pipeline and get ready to go when that hiring demand comes up. So I always tell candidates um, because I want to set that expectation with them mm-hmm. that, hey, you know, it's sometimes a moving target. It doesn't mean that we're going to get done with this interview in one week, in two weeks. It could get paused. It could get, you know, um, moved along quicker, you know, at a later point. Mm-hmm. It just varies. Right, right. Okay, yeah. Because, I, I mean, it's, like, so crazy for me to think that, like, a company needs a team like that because mm-hmm. they're always hiring people. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, you know, you were talking about like um, how you take time to like learn during your your day too, if time allows. Um, like what you mentioned the word like hi- hiring trends. Excuse me. I'm just mm-hmm. like getting familiar with the vocabulary you're using. But um, like what is an example of that? Yeah, good question. So I'm in the technology space. Uh-huh. Um, and so... Um, I've read somewhere um, years ago that hiring trends kind of go um, in, in technology based on how the economy is doing, okay, right? Okay. Um, and so when I was at another company years back, when the economy was kind of at a lull, um, you know, there were not a lot of companies that were hiring um, and doing innovative work or spending a lot of money 
um, you know, building and customizing. There always were some, but there are those kind of um, ebbs and flows that happen um, in I that see. space. But, you know, right now I recently read an article that there's this big kind of uh, movement happening where they're calling this mass exodus potential where a lot of people are switching jobs and they're kind of evaluating what's important to them, um, kind of stemming from COVID, right? right? Having this flexible work environment mm -hmm. and then potentially having to go back um, in an in-person kind of um, structure where, you know, they may not want to anymore. So it's, it was really interesting to kind of hear that, but mm. um, definitely what I've seen in the past couple of years, especially right now, there is lots of hiring kind of going on. I think when COVID happened, um, when I say none of us were prepared for it, regardless of what company, what industry, what type of you know, um, organization, whether it's consulting or a staffing firm or an industry company, um, I think there was this quick, like, we got to figure out what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of people, unfortunately, that were impacted and laid off, um, really good, talented people. And then other companies um, made it part of their mission to, we're not going to lay anybody off, right? Mm -hmm. Or if we do, yes. we're going to make an effort to hire them back when things get better. And now there's this fight for talent, right? Um, and kind of in the space that I'm in too, I talk to my different friends, everyone's looking for really good recruiters. Um, and and it's, it's a space that is great for people that have that background or want to get into it, but it's also tough for companies that want to quickly hire because they don't have the right people in place to either drive that mm -hmm. or um, the right talent out there to get them to come to those companies. Interesting. Wow. That is so, <laughs> I mean, like everything you said kind of makes sense to me too. Cause mm -hmm. I, I mean, even um, like I said, I've never been through a hiring, like big hiring process, but like even mm -hmm. my husband, um, like, you know, he got used to working from home and his mm -hmm. company is a, a little more, um, I guess, old school in the sense of um, they just it's not a it's not a young group of engineers. He works for an engineering mm -hmm. firm. And so they're not used to working from home. Right. So right. even David. Right. He's like my husband. He's like. You know, like, I know there are other companies that probably work from home and, mm -hmm. you know, he's not quitting his job, but, <laughs> but, um, it's, it, what you're saying makes sense to me, just even from hearing in my own household, like how he feels yeah. because, and how the effects of COVID is probably affecting a ton of people in quitting their jobs and finding something else. For sure. You know, I think it does. Um, I think COVID you know, it was a tough period and just in terms of mental well-being, um, but also, you know, change of, of, of how people work. So for me, the silver lining is I hope more organizations mm -hmm. and companies recognize good work can take place anywhere, right? So I yes. typically work at places that were more traditional where they needed to see you to see that you were working. Right, and right. I think what COVID, it taught a lot of companies is people can do good work um, kind of anywhere, you know, whether they're yeah. sitting at the beach or doing it from <laughs> their home or doing it from their closet yeah. or doing it from an office. And mm -hmm. so I hope it's a big kind of wake up um, mm -hmm. and kind of a nudge to mm -hmm. recognize that companies have to kind of um, maybe adapt and be flexible in that, mm -hmm. recognizing that's what people may now be seeking out, yes. you're seeking more of, right? Yes. Like you said, your husband may kind of evaluate to say, hey, okay, do I need to think about maybe going elsewhere? I've talked to other candidates and friends that said the same thing, like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm supposed to go back. I'm not ready to go back. You know, I'm wanting to go to a company that's going to give me that flexibility. Right. So, okay. So you're kind of, you know, the middleman in the very beginning of hiring. So I'm curious, like things like, um, the example we just gave right now, or maybe other things like, do you advocate for the person that is interviewing as well? So I would say I do. Um, in the role that I get to be in, um, I'm kind of that first initial gatekeeper, right? Okay. Um, in terms of kind of applicants that come through. And um, my passion of what I love doing personally is I love to um, 
serve. I love to help others. I have a passion for people. Um, and so when you say that, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's really what I feel I do. I may not go outwardly say that, but sure. I do um, want to be that advocate to that candidate, mm. right? Um, and of course, keeping it fair um, in many aspects, but the same token, maybe coaching them, you know, helping them to, you know, um, be a better, you know, be better in interviewing or how they organize their resume or um, kind of honing in on the importance of soft skills and emotional intelligence, right? Um, so for me, that's an area of passion for me. I'm a mentor at UGA. Um, and so when I help my friends interview or look for jobs or help with salary negotiations or even um, people coming right out of school or others more professional, even at places I've recruited candidates that we may not select them, mm -hmm. but I still want to give them things that they can work on so that that could then help them maybe where else they're interviewing at. That's so yes, amazing. definitely to yeah. be kind of a uh, a, a, you know, an advocate, a little angel on their shoulder. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I mean, and I guess for some reason I have this, um, thought in my head that like, I guess like you're a kind of, since you work for the company, mm -hmm. like that you would side with them. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. And so I guess that's why I was curious because, you know, but then it seems as though you, you want both things to come together and work out for the best so exactly yes okay. it's that it's that you know and I wrestled with that a lot um you you honestly hit the nail on the head again um uh, but it is that kind of world because you represent the company mm. um but I'm also representing this candidate right and there are times where through my screen, I have to be the one to say, hey, I don't think this is the right role for you or we're the right company for you. Mm -hmm. I have those tough conversations because I'm looking out for that candidate. But I'm also looking out for my company, right, where mm -hmm. it's a two-way street. It's just mm -hmm. not, is a candidate a good fit for this company and this role? Mm -hmm. But is are we good enough? for this candidate and what they're looking for and what's most important to them. So um, it is kind of looking at both of those lens and seeing how they can kind of come together. Um, so, yeah, I agree. You, you have to look at it from the company side, but um, I'm also one that I'm not going to force kind of, a, a, you know, a, a round piece to fall into a square if I know it's not going to align just right. to make it fit, just to get the higher. Right, right. Oh, man. So crazy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'm curious, like, is it possible for you to kind of maybe even walk me through, like, how you would even approach a candidate and, like, how that even that process kind of starts? Yes, um, I would love to. I would love to. So um, there's a couple of different avenues that a candidate can come through. Um applying to a job, right? A company may post their job or you may see a company, you know, um, um, attend the career fair, right? Or see it on LinkedIn saying, hey, we're looking for X, Y, Z. So um, there are applicants that come through those different ways, but then sometimes candidates come through referrals, right? Where um, someone that works at, you know, one company says, hey, I vouch for this person, I work with them, I know their work ethic, or I know them from this community, you know, mm -hmm. and then they refer them over. So it's either applying to a job um, is where we can find some candidates, mm -hmm. um, referrals, or it's me looking for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I will look for them on LinkedIn. Um, a lot of organizations have this LinkedIn recruiter kind of side of LinkedIn mm -hmm. where you can search candidates and you can kind of secretly see who's confidentially looking for new opportunities or open to those discussions without that person notifying their company that they're looking. So oh, there's wow. some feature on that side that you can kind of do that. Um, so sometimes I'm hunting for them on LinkedIn. Other times I'll look on different job boards, Dice, um, you know, Monster, Career Builder, uh, within my network, um, you know, people that I grew up with or people in different, you know, um, user groups out there, mm -hmm. like Women's in Technology or, or um, you know, I went to University of Georgia. So, you know, tapping into that network there as well. So a number of different avenues. So then a candidate comes through and then if 
we find a good alignment, the candidate's interested in talking, we schedule an interview. Mm -hmm. And my normal process is I do a phone interview with this person to kind of do the first leg of screen, right? Okay. Um, and then from there, um, if everything goes well and aligned, there's a mutual agreement that we move forward to an in-person interview. And that's a little bit more in depth. And my interview style is one, not to intimidate. I say that to a lot of candidates when I first interview them, like, don't be nervous. You know, I'm not here to stump you or to trick you up. My mm -hmm. intent is to learn as much about you and what's most important to you, what you're looking for and see if it matches to what we are, right? Mm -hmm. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it's more kind of conversational, but behavioral, um, situational mm -hmm. and some alignment in terms of what have you done. From there, um, there could be a technical interview because I recruit a lot for the IT side. And so that's a separate interview where this person is really being able to be tested or assessed um, beyond just the talk of it, but showing someone what they have worked on, right? If they pass that, then there's leadership interviews and then roundtable discussions take place. And then from there, we're able to decide which candidates we can move forward to an offer and extend an offer. So that's kind of a really abbreviated version of kind of that interview um, life cycle. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> as you're talking, I'm like, so excited for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm getting interviewed or something. But um that's really cool. So, um, I, you know, I was going to ask you if you could share some tips with like some postgraduate, like, you know, newly postgrads that are looking for jobs. Um, and I don't, I was going to do that at the end, but I guess this would be a good time, a segue to kind of chat about that if you're open to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say the biggest thing, if you're looking at post-grad or, you know, you're about to graduate, um, don't focus on money and title. Um, mm -hmm. I always try to educate um, candidates. You know, I've talked to a lot of candidates where right out of school, I'm looking for X, Y, Z, right? Mm -hmm. um, this kind of dollar amount. And sometimes um, they're doing themselves a disservice because they're only focusing on one thing. So I always tell candidates, have a wish list of things that are most important to you, whether you're right out of school or you're a mid-level experienced um, employee or a, a senior level employee, right? Have a wish list of what's most important to you, what's negotiable, what's not, right? Um, and then from there, you know, you then kind of assess if, hey, is this opportunity aligning to that? So um, I'm big on that. Someone coming right out of school, I always say be humble, uh, but be open, mm -hmm. um, be coachable, uh, right? Um, there's so much for you to learn. It's more important, in my opinion, and this is just mine, that um, you go to a company that's equally invested in you just as much as you're gonna be invested in them, right? Mm -hmm. So a place that they're gonna allow you to learn, make the mistakes, to teach you new things, to allow you to kind of spread your wings and learn different things, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's so imperative when you're starting off, I think, to have that support, not that handholding, yeah. but to kind of have that guidance, to have that good foundation because right. the money and title, um, will always come mm -hmm. later on. When you build enough skills, then you're able to kind of leverage that to get that. But if in the beginning, all you're focused on is the dollar amount, you may be missing out on a really cool opportunity to accompany culture that you're, you know, going to feel valued and be able to drive your career, learn new things, you know, feel like you have a seat at the table. Um, you know, I'm not saying you can't get that at a more higher paying job, but if it's just your main objective of I'm looking for this title and this role right out of school, um, there may be a lot of other things that you may have missed out on. Yeah, I love that. I love everything you just <laughs> said. That is such great advice, you know, and and it's so it rings so true. You know, you mm. work through college with something in mind, an expectation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when you can't meet this expectation that honestly could it be unrealistic at times mm -hmm. real talk you know yeah and then you just feel defeated yeah and didn't learn anything man mm -hmm. esther i wish you would recruit me because I, I just feel <laughs> like you know everything you just said too is like um so valuable mm. you know and i don't imagine all recruiters say the same thing as you do but mm. but yeah i mean that's really great um 
you know, would you mind sharing some tips on like, um, okay, so one thing for me, the one time I got hired out of college, yes. and they asked me like, how much I want to get paid, right? And I'm yes. like, what? <laughs> like, I, you know, because I had no clue, right. like, the situation. I'm like, no one told me they're going to ask me what I want my salary to be. Yep. And it just seems like such an awkward question, especially straight out of college, right? And I'm like, I... And then someone kind of advised me, like, oh, calculate, like, you know, cost of living mm-hmm. and then all that. But at the same time, I didn't want to, like, offend them. Right. So, like, what... what what are your tips on that? Okay, so this is just my perspective. Um, okay. So this is just kind of how I view it. Uh-huh. Um, I'll kind of back up a little bit. I ask candidates questions all the time of, hey, what are you targeting? Where are you at, et cetera, right? And sometimes candidates automatically, they're kind of, um, kind of this alert mode goes on. Or, you know, why do you need to know that? You know, what is the position ping, right? And the objective is not to pigeonhole somebody. At least that's not how I recruit, mm-hmm. right? I want to make things very equitable mm-hmm. and fair. Um, but we ask that, um, or I have asked that because I don't want to waste the candidate's time, right? Mm-hmm. If the candidate has an unrealistic expectation or even they feel they deserve this mm-hmm. and I know it doesn't align to what we can hire someone in at, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm pretty shoot it straight, um, Mm -hmm. you know, with my candidates because I don't want to mislead, right? Um, But there are other times candidates will share with me, hey, I don't really want to disclose what I'm making because I feel I'm not at market and I don't want to be held at a disadvantage. And I totally get that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I've been there myself, you know, you know, in years past. Um, And I think it's so crucial to have, again, this advocate, this recruiter that's going to be able to um, pass along that right information to that company, mm-hmm. right? Uh, mm-hmm. My recommendation is we hire this person at this. This is mm-hmm. what they're targeting. It doesn't always work out that way, but that recruiter needs to be that voice for that candidate that's not sitting at that table when that time comes, right? But mm-hmm. um, yeah, salary sticky. My advice to a candidate is Again, when you're first starting off, show flexibility. Doesn't mean that, hey, I'm going to work for $5 an hour, or $10 an hour, right? Um, you know, do your research first, you know, look right. online. There's so much available research available out there at your fingertips, research that. And I always tell candidates, use it as a grain of salt because someone may list on salaries.com or on Glassdoor, this is the salary, but someone may not be factoring in certain, you know, geographic locations where there's different costs of living. Sometimes they may be factoring in their bonuses or their benefits and someone else isn't, but it gives you kind of, um, a general guideline of what it may be, and then take that information and compare it to um, other sites, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe as you talk to other recruiters and they tell you, hey, this position is paying this, or on some companies, they're going to list, hey, this position, the salary target is this, right? Mm -hmm. So you have all these these different data points. Mm -hmm. Um, And data data is data. You use it to your advantage, right? Gather all of that information and then recognize, okay, this is what I'm seeing the average, or this is what I feel, you know, I want to target. And you Mm -hmm. can kind of share that. Another thing to talk to your friends, you know, compensation is this such taboo area. And I try not, um, I try to break that taboo. um, Mm -hmm. Because even being, you know, Asian, we don't really talk about that, right? No, yeah, um, absolutely not. No. <laughs> yeah, it's very kind of taboo. Companies don't talk about it. And sometimes mm-hmm. there's reasons why companies don't because, you know, they don't want that information kind of coming out of, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, but for me, it gives somebody good data points, right? Um, and kind of a, a general idea of, okay, this person just started off or has three years of experience coming into this. They have a similar background as me. It gives you somewhat of an idea. For me, salary talk is like asking me what my favorite color is. Um, I try to make it that much, you know, because the more you know, the better that you can kind of set yourself up, right? right so right. it's it's a funny area. My advice to candidates is, give a range, a realistic range, and a range that you know that um, you would be open to taking, right? Mm. Um, If you don't want to get ruled out, 
in that process and you want it to keep going further um, and you know you're negotiable for the right opportunity, say, hey, I'm negotiable for the right opportunity, you know, um, and you could always, again, flip the script back and ask, well, what's the targeted, you know, compensation for this level or for this role? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the company will, will reveal that. Oh, man, so stressful right now. <laughs> You know, it is. It really is. Um, but I'll tell you one secret. It sometimes annoys recruiters um, when when a candidate is so close to the vest. I don't want to I don't want to tell you what I'm making. And I get it. Right. right because, again, right. they don't want to um, be, you know, at a disadvantage. Right. But right. I think what is most important is trust. Mm -hmm. You have to trust your recruiter. A recruiter has to trust that candidate. Right. Mm -hmm. That relationship has to be formed, kind of a mutual level of trust, right? right. And then you're kind of re able to help that person out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. So like, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, this is really good stuff. I hope you're listening. Uh <laughs> well, I will also say too, you know, when you're looking for a job, um, you know, even before getting the interview, the toughest part is getting to that interview. You know, I remember right. coming right out of school and I would see all these fancy companies and logos that I grew up seeing out there on TV and all of that. And I'm like, oh, I could do that job and I'll apply to a position or I could do that. And I had no business doing that. Right. <laughs> but I felt like, oh, I could learn that. I'm a quick learner. Mm -hmm. Seeing it from the other side now, mm -hmm. from the inside out, uh -huh. I recognize, man, what a disservice I did. Right. Mm -hmm. A whether I was experienced or aligned to it or not, I didn't take the time to align my resume to what that company was looking for, right? So I encourage candidates, you know, um, look at a job description, spend the time to carefully tailor um, to make sure your resume articulates um, what can align to that company, right? right. You don't want to copy it, right? And you don't want to put something that's not accurate, mm -hmm. but if you've done it, you want to make sure to capture that. And I always say when you're working on your resume, um, it should tell a story. It's beyond the I've done X, Y, Z. It's it's the why, the how, you know, how much did I save the company? How did I add value, right? It's recognizing those other elements opposed to just listing X, Y, Z. This is what I've done. This is what I've done. And I've also done this. Um, so that would be one thing in terms of the resume. And then looking for a job is a job in and of itself, you know, practicing, interviewing, mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't want to be robotic and you want it to be authentic and yourself, but there's a lot of things that, you know, you can kind of practice on, right. Kind of working out the interview jitters. Um, when I first interviewed, it used to make me so nervous. I would sweat, my voice would quiver. Um, it would get me so antsy and I had to learn to cope to recognize, okay, I need to calm myself down. I need to work on different things that's going to help me not make my voice quiver, mm -hmm. um, to not show that I'm nervous. And the more you do something, the more you get comfortable with it. So mm -hmm. even practicing in front of a mirror, asking questions, having your friend ask you questions and you responding to it, it creates a level of more ease and comfort mm -hmm. that then will hopefully translate when you're in front of that stranger that's interviewing you for your dream job. Right. And man, this is... Um really fascinating for me and one of the things that comes to mind is you know people looking for jobs I mean I don't know if they they do this mm. you know like I like like really take it seriously <laughs> like do you know what I mean yeah like I yes. think you they just kind of think oh surely I'll find a job and then uh -huh. they realize it's serious you know and yeah. and they but and the fact that you can actually practice you know it's not something mm -hmm. you have to go in cold but yeah. I think you giving the permission to do that is mm -hmm. speaks volumes for me because I'm like yeah like yeah they should practice you know <laughs> <laughs> well I always kind of jokingly always um, said interviewing is like dating Mm. right um someone may be great on paper right um and you're like yes. yes they have such great qualities I can't wait to go on the date with right this person. right and then when you talk with them or speak with them over the phone you're like no this is not gonna <laughs> lie right and so I translate that in kind of a humorous way to interviewing yeah. and you know there's so much kind of the emotional intelligence the soft skills how you're articulating things um you know not just what you're saying, but how you're saying mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. uh, that makes that impact. So, so uh, okay. So, yeah. So 
it's not always about the skill then. It's what you're saying to me. So I think it goes hand in hand. I will say that. So I definitely recruited for more mid-level senior roles that was very skill-based, right? Um, Where they need to have the XYZ kind of technical experience or aligned experience. But the same token, um, a lot of how I recruited, it wasn't just that. It was sort of, again, like dating. Mm -hmm. You know, is this somebody that I can see myself working comfortably with? Um, happily in a team environment, you know, do I want this person on my team? Do I want this person representing my company? Right. Mm. Um, there were so many other elements that really kind of married, not just good technical skills, Mm -hmm. but that soft skills, right. Mm, Is this person going to be hard to work with? Are they going to be combative? Are they going to complain a lot? Are they going to, you know, just come in and, you know, not be a team player or just, you know, whatnot, right? There's a mixture of things. So there is a psychology, I think, behind it. But yes, it doesn't mean that they're going to hire every nice guy and gal. Mm. They also, of course, have to be able to deliver. Um, When I hire more junior candidates, there's still some maybe, you know, experienced technical skills that they must have. But a lot of it is also more about being high potential candidate, right? Mm -hmm. Someone that has the potential that needs that just foot in the door with the right guidance, the right coaching, the right mentorship, they're going to be able to learn the other things. You really are a matchmaker, Esther. (laughs) Like I'm like, yes, like that makes complete sense to me, like your definition of what what it is that you do. Um, But now I really want to know, like, how did you become a recruiter? Like, where did this start? Like, did you study this? Tell me all everything. Yes, <laughs> you can, you can yes. even take me back to like high school, you know, before you started yeah. college. Sure. So I'll be honest. Um, I didn't seek this position out. Um, I think it found me and I know it sounds really kind of corny um, saying that, but um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Right. Mm. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I always wanted to serve or help others out. So I thought my career and my calling from God was I'm going to go into nonprofit, Mm -hmm. or I'm going to be a teacher, um, or I want to be a speech pathologist and help, you know, kids that have speaking disabilities, or, uh, you know, someone that went through a stroke, and you're going to help them to learn how to, you know, talk again, kind of thing. You know, I always knew, I just wanted to serve, I wanted to help out, right. And then uh, I remember as a kid, um, some of my, you know, parents, friends, or people I went to church with, they're like, Esther would be a great pastor's wife. She would be a great someone, right? And I would always hear that occasionally. And I never knew what they meant by it, but I guess just my personality or whatever, they're like, she would be so great at that. And I remember one time, I didn't say it in front of them, just create etiquette. But I remember going to my mom um, one time afterwards and saying, why are they saying that? You know, why are they saying that they could see me as a pastor's wife? And nothing wrong with being a pastor, pastor's wife, of course, but of course. I've always been that kid that kind of question why why right how come and I I remember jokingly saying to my mom what if I wanted to be the pastor you know why, <laughs> why couldn't I be <laughs> so you know long story short you know I just knew I wanted to do that right yeah. but coming out of school um I graduated with a psychology and sociology degree and I didn't want to go and get my master's and go get my PhD in that Mm. space. But I love those two areas of studies. Right. Right. Um, And so for me, I always felt that the end goal is being able to align your passion and what you love doing to getting that to be your job yes, and getting paid for it, right? Preach it. <laughs> like that is like the ideal space. It doesn't always work out that way. And I always encourage you, well, have hobbies that have side things that you're passionate about to make sure you're feeding those things that inspire and excite mm-hmm. you. But that was always, I felt kind of that, that goal, right. Mm-hmm. That we all strive to have. Um, so it kind of fell accidentally. I didn't know I wanted to be in recruiting, I, you know, in college, I didn't go to college to be a in talent acquisition, didn't even know that existed, but um, it kind of happened that way. And long story short, right out of um, college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And through someone my parents knew at one of their customers, I got an opportunity to interview for pharmaceutical sales. And um, I researched it. I was like, oh, this is exciting. I love building relationships. I'm passionate about people. I want to help others out. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. But um, when I was going through the interview process um, at that time, 
when you're first starting off, you're not able to maybe be in the city that you want to be in, right? In a big metropolitan city or elsewhere, you would have to relocate and kind of, you know, prove yourself, learn the chops and grow from there. Mm. And as I was going through the interview process, as great and exciting as it was, I wasn't ready to move. Mm. Um, I grew up in Atlanta. I grew up in Roswell. I did all of my schooling from elementary to college here in Georgia. I went to the University of Georgia, go dogs. Go dogs. Um, <laughs> and I did my professional career here. So I wasn't ready to do that. So I politely, you know, kind of stopped the interview process there. And then I went into another company called Guardian, which was like an um, insurance brokerage kind of company. Um, you know, and it was kind of great first coming out of school, but again, something that I felt, oh, this is not my calling, right? Mm. And I was always seeking this out. So I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And for the interim, I was like, I'm just going to go get a temp job, a contracting job at a staffing agency with one of their clients until I figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I had an appointment (laughs) um, with this one staffing company um, on the same floor, but there's two buildings. And I accidentally walked into the wrong building on that floor, I got up on the elevator. I'm like, this isn't the company's name, you know, that it was supposed to be. But I walked into this other staffing company and was just talking to the front desk person that was working there. And I'm like, hey, I'm looking for this company. I had this appointment. They're like, oh, it happens all the time. It's the other building kind of, you know, across the way on the same floor. But as I was just chit-chatting with that person, because I'll just talk to anybody, (laughs) uh, they were like, hey, leave me your resume. You know, maybe, you know, we have something with our client that, you know, we can, I'll pass your resume along. Didn't think much of it. And um, later that afternoon, I got a call from this woman who was the VP there that ended up being my boss. And so then I got my foot in the door in staffing. And what staffing is, is, Um, you partner with certain companies, your companies are the clients, right? And they may have um, hiring needs based on certain projects where they need to ramp up or ramp down. Um, Sometimes they're full-time positions, so they pay a fee to get that candidate. And other times they're only there for this contract period. And so I went into more of an account management role there uh, where I got to cultivate those accounts and generate new business that came through. Um, and then I was quickly moved up into a branch manager role. So I got to manage um, a branch, you know, manage recruiters, you know, um, had p responsibility, all of this stuff. So being at the young age, I was right out of school. I just thought it was a really kind of neat opportunity to see all facets of that type of business. Yeah. Um, you know, I made mistakes, but I learned a lot. Um, I had people that supported me and helped me to have that space to grow. Um, so that's where I kind of started off in staffing. And then from there, I stemmed into kind of IT, um, kind of IT staffing, um, and then got to do recruiting. Um, and then fast forward, I got to make the move over to corporate recruiting. And so corporate recruiting was always a place I think a lot of people in staffing wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of this connector to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But I just was not ready to make that move. Um, And I remember when opportunities came, it was just the fear of the unknown. What if I Mm -hmm. fail at it? What if I don't like it? Mm -hmm. You know, what if I, you know, miss what I'm doing here, right? Um, And then I had someone share with me, um, years back and said, what if you end up liking it? What if it's better? You know, and it was this light bulb that kind of went off of perspective of, yeah, what if it is better, right? Um, And if it's not, hey, I learned something from it, right? So that became kind of my mantra in every new place I went to, right? Um, Take the risk, take the the challenge, right? Um, It works out great. If it doesn't, you know, you learn from it. And now I kick myself for taking so long, (laughs) to make that leap over there because of that fear of, you know, the doubt and the insecurity that I had if I wouldn't succeed in it, right? Um, So in hindsight, I wish I did it sooner. Um, I love the corporate recruiting side um, because it's more relationship focused opposed Mm -hmm. to staffing sometimes being a little bit more transactional. Um, And that is something that um, speaks a lot to my heart and soul. Well, that's crazy because <laughs> you stepped into the wrong building yeah. and then ended up <laughs> changing the trajectory of your life. Yeah, for it's, sure. That is insane. Um, so, okay, you know, 
you you said that you kind of had some doubts and fears just of the unknown going into corporate recruiting, which you ended up enjoying. But um, were you just f- like fearing the change? I'm just curious. Or like, was it like, cause is it completely different? So it is different in a lot of different ways. It's different in a lot of ways. In some ways, it's similar. Okay. Um, I recognize how different it is uh-huh. once I was in it, right? I uh, but I think for me, it was a little bit of, um, you know, self-doubt, right? Um, you know, not feeling confident of, of me doing well in this. I knew what I knew and mm-hmm. I was good at what I knew, right? Mm-hmm. And this was my comfort space. Sure, um, yeah. And so it was a mixture of that, of what if I go and try this and I fail at it? Um, I fall flat on my face or I don't even get the job and right, I right. embarrass myself in the interview process or I do it and I don't like it, mm-hmm. right? And um, it was a lot of, I think, what many of us go through, whether we want to admit it or not, um, you know, about just taking that risk. So now one of my favorite things to kind of share with candidates just kind of as my post testimony is faith over fear Mm -hmm. right you know take the lead take the chance you know um and again going back to it if it works out great you know if it doesn't hey it's okay you can go back to what you were doing Mm -hmm. um you learn something else from it for me I always try to remind candidates you, you don't want to move your job every one year, two years, right? Because from a company's perspective, they look at it, oh, he or she is a job offer, right? But at the same token, um, sometimes you don't know what you want until you try different stuff, right? Right, right? And then you take all of those things of where different places you work, different management styles, different kind of environments, and then you're able to kind of create this, you know, canvas of this is what is my strong suit. This is where I really thrive in, in this type of environment. This is where I want to now be a part of. And it mm-hmm. helps somebody to then frame, um, to either uh, step into their destination company mm-hmm. or to get to their desti- destination I company. And I think you're only able to do that the more you kind of experience other things, if right. that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense. I mean, you don't know what you want until you know what you want. So. Yeah. No, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Man. Um, so you said that the staffing company kind of gets your foot into the door of corporate recruiting um, and co- corporate staffing. Um, like, is that usually the way, like networking? Like, how does one become a recruiter then? Like, is yes. there a major for this or? <laughs> so there, there is not a major for it. Um, staffing a lot of companies are focused more on the education side. They're looking for more of a person's like um, attitude, you know, okay. how resilient they are. If okay. they're a go-getter, you know, there's a sales element for it, a metrics element sometimes at different companies. So it's a great space for people that may want to venture into that, you know, either sales side, account management, or even recruiting, mm-hmm. you know, to start off in staffing, right? I see. Um, I'm grateful for my years in staffing because it really created a level of discipline of, of you know, how I work today. I, I felt it's from all that training grounds and staffing because yeah. it's go, go, go. You know, mm-hmm. you have to learn quick. You have to pivot quick. You have to you know, um, work fast, um, you have to build that pipeline. Um, Mm -hmm. And on the corporate recruiting side, the pace is a little bit different. And I had to adjust and adapt to that. But Mm -hmm. um, it was great training grounds for it. So it's a great foot in the door for a lot of people that may not have some aligned experience to test that out. Some love it, some don't like it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then from there, I've even known some friends that were in staffing that got recruited to their clients. So maybe they're supporting, I'm just going to name, you know, telecom company. And that was their client. And later on, they found out they had an opening and then they wanted, and, you know, they were selected to, you know, come on as their recruiter over there, their talent acquisition. So I've seen that. Um, For me, I came to my previous company through a referral, um, who was uh, someone that I worked with that became my boss. So I'm also big on that. Make sure Mm -hmm. you establish, you know, good, solid relationships, Mm -hmm. uh, because you never know where people will end up, but not um, using it just for that leverage, but just recognizing, hey, we're all here to help each other, right? Um, You could help somebody, you know, and they could then help you maybe as well. Yes. Man, that's, 
so much information right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, so I'm an external processor too. So that's uh-huh. why I keep like kind of reiterating the things that you're saying just so that I can understand fully what it is that everything you do, which you do so much, I feel like in just, um, there's so many different parts of it mm-hmm. that have to happen and for everything to kind of work together too. And um, would you say like, what are some qualities or personality traits or characteristics of of your own personality that you feel like um, helps you be a better recruiter? Hmm. Like, because, you know, you said that you feel like you've really been able to find um, the serving part, like Mm -hmm. what you what you really care about and align Mm -hmm. it with a job that you can be passionate about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like what are what are I guess serving is one of them, maybe. Yeah. But what about like um other like yeah, other do you have to be a multitasker? I don't know. <laughs> yes, I would say multitasker for sure. Mm-hmm. Um someone um that is resilient, which mm-hmm. means that, you know, right now there may be 10 positions that they're looking for with this skill set. Um and you focus on all of that, but then it may pivot to just four and now they need, you know, someone with this skill set and now 20 of them, right? And then, you know, one month later, it switched to this. Um, It's being resilient where things can change and how quickly can I adapt to that, right? Um, Another aspect of being resilient is, you know, you really love a candidate and you know this person's great, but through the interview process, you know, somewhere along the way, someone says, no, this person, you know, we don't want to move forward. You have to be able to bounce back, right? Mm -hmm. And take that with stride. Mm -hmm. Um, I think coachability is really big too, right? Um, I'm a firm believer, you don't know everything, right? There's always room to learn more. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, how I wanted to better myself as just an employee, but also as a recruiter is taking feedback, right? Um, And hey, what were the gaps? You know, what what should I work on? Um, I used to seek out feedback, um, you know, as I grew older in my career, in the beginning, it was tough, you know, being Korean, you know, I grew up probably as, as many um, uh, others that are minorities and immigrants is you work several steps harder than everybody else. You know, you wake up an hour before everyone else, you do more, you have to, you know, it was always kind of instilled in, in me and us mm-hmm. from my parents and, and just kind of that work ethic. Mm-hmm. And so in the beginning, when I first started my career, it was tough. It was mm-hmm. tough to hear, you know, um, the stuff you have to work or improve on. It was fun to hear the great stuff, right? Um, And it was tough, but I recognized um, after I kind of matured that, you know, somebody that's giving you um, advice to better you, they gain nothing and you gain everything, right? Mm -hmm. If they're coming from a good place and a good heart, take that. (laughs) If they say, hey, Esther, you got to work on this or you need to improve this, you know, don't look at that as an attack to you, but Hey, this person's really trying to sharpen. They're trying to sharpen me. Right. And so now I seek it out. Any like performance review times I go on, I'm like, manager, what can I work or improve on? You know, give me guidance. I seek it out because I'm like, Hey, this person is going to help me to be Mm -hmm. better um, at what I do, but just me as a person. So I think that's really important too. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, um, as somebody that, in my younger years also did not take criticism very well, yes. you know, <laughs> and, you know, really took it to heart yes. in, a, in a negative way. But I feel like what you're saying, um, if I had just learned that quicker and mm. been more mature about it, you're absolutely right. You know, they gain nothing. Only mm-hmm. I gain from whatever it is that they're saying, especially if they have, they're in the right place to say it. And I think that's something that everybody, whether you want to be a recruiter or anything else, like just being teachable and and open is like something it's really, really valuable as a person, honestly. For sure. Relationship wise, you know, friendship wise, um, professionally, 100 percent. I think Mm -hmm. it it makes a difference um, in a number of ways. (laughs) Man, well, um. Am I forgetting anything? Did you want to share something else that maybe I didn't touch on or didn't ask you about? Yeah, um, let me think. Um, 
No, you've asked such great questions. You know, I would say um, something that I wanted to kind of share, you know, for those that are, um, you know, looking to, you know, grow their career, you know, take the risks, um, you know, do what's uncomfortable, you know, that's where, you know, kind of, um, you know, character development takes place, right? But also you get to stretch yourself to learn what you're capable of doing and what you enjoy doing, you know? Yeah. Um, for me, um, that's something I've worked towards. Mm -hmm. You know, I one thing that I recognized um, when I first started working professionally, I was always that token Asian. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the why, the, 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 you know, the kid that always asked why, how come it's this way and questioning it, um, it always kind of bothered me, right? You know, why were there not um, other people that look like me in mm -hmm. at this company or in these leadership roles, right? You know, why couldn't, you know, I do that, right? Um, but that was always something that sat in the back of my mind. And um, the change that I hope that I can bring um, two candidates, um, and not everyone needs to move up to leadership roles, right? That's not what um, I'm saying. But, you know, for those that desire that or may not see that potential in themselves, you know, I always want to challenge people. And even when I talk to candidates, um, that they deserve to have a seat at that table, mm -hmm. uh, but also to be able to engage and to lead, um, you know, with everything that's happened, you know, this past year with, you know, Amard Arbery, Breonna Taylor, you know, um, George Floyd, and then the API hate, you know, it's, I think, kind of become the forefront of a lot of organizations and how they hire, what they want to make their mission statement, what they want to brand their organization. But more importantly, for me, it's not about just putting up a statement. It's what's the actionable items. There are yes. employees that are hurting at the company from those backgrounds, um, you know, that, what are we doing to um, show that we support them and we care about them? So um, one of the things that, you know, I was pushing for at my previous company before I left was I wanted to build out, um, we have different ERGs or employee resources groups. So mm -hmm. I wanted to help build one out for API, um, you know, and then one for Hispanic um, and Latina, uh, mm -hmm. Latinos as well. And the mission statement that I kind of put together to present was, um, beyond, you know, kind of educating, you know, the unconscious bias, the, you know, uh, the minority, you know, model minority myth out there, you know, um, the stereotypes of, you know, Asians are just worker bees, you know, they're the doers, they're going to be meek, you know, mm -hmm. um, you don't really see them as the leadership positions, but mm -hmm. they're going to be behind the scenes doing the work. I wanted to change that narrative, yeah. right? Um, you know, and I, part of the thing was, you know, educating, um, you know, breaking those barriers and stereotypes, but it was also, you know, trying to link up mentors for some of these minority groups at these companies, right? And to, pair them um, to help create a career path for leadership if some mm. of those people desire that, right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, that was something that um, was passionate and important for me that um, that I wanted to push more for. So that's a risk, right? You know, that you're mm. taking to be bold, to kind of question, you know, how things are being done. But um, I love it that we're at a time where that's embraced a lot of times, right? Where companies are open to that. Um, because they want it better than what they were before. Yes. And so, you know, kind of with that, it's just take the risk, you know, be bold. Um, you know, if you want to have a seat at that leadership table, know that, you know, you yourself, you know, can have that shot just as well as the person next to you. Kind yeah, of that's thing, interesting so. that you say that because, you know, if I evaluate myself, I can't speak mm. for our entire Asian American community, obviously, but it, just me and myself. Yeah. I think, you know, thinking about applying to a job, right. You mm. want to do everything right, mm. you know, cause you want the job. And I think there is a lack of boldness for me. Mm. If, if, you know, to do anything out of the ordinary or say something risky mm. because you mm. just want to do it perfect. Mm. you know and so I think what you just said man really resonates with me because um it it makes me realize that yeah I mean this 
for such a time as right now, you know, like this is when people are ready to embrace the risks that people mm-hmm. are willing to speak about. So, man, thank you, Esther. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> All of it is so great and so awesome. Um, would you be open to maybe if someone had a question about maybe being interested in a career as a recruiter or maybe if they have a question about their resume, would you be open to helping them or maybe even just having a conversation with them? 100%. Um, I I do that a lot for my friends and um, just different individuals. So I would love to be a resource um, for others in terms of those things that you mentioned. You know, on top of that, I encourage everybody get mentors, Mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, people at your company, people that look like you, but people that don't, you know, um, I was an Asian female in IT space, which you don't see a lot of. Um, it's a male dominated right, arena, right. but you know, I've been fortunate to have male leaders that were mentors of mine um, because it's important. They become allies and advocates for you. Um, when you're not able to have those discussions at those tables, they can highlight, Hey, Blair would be excellent for this, mm-hmm. you know, or, yeah, you know, yeah. Chris would be really great at this. Let's mm-hmm. give them that opportunity. So hundred mm-hmm. percent, you know, and even peer mentors. So yeah, if anybody has any questions about resume, interviewing tips, LinkedIn profile, um, my background or other areas. Yeah. I am an open book and I want to share as much as I can to help better somebody else in what they want to do. You are so great, Esther. Thank you so much. I, you guys, I just, uh, you know, I don't want to, I want to emphasize actually that um, I feel like Esther, she's such a great soul, but on top of that, you know, she is so knowledgeable. And so uh, I don't want anyone to miss out on an opportunity to, uh, yeah, to be resourced. You know, for me, that's the point of this podcast is to uh, just provide one more resource for those that that maybe don't have the access to the to the resources that other people have. So um, if you have any comments or questions, uh, feel free to DM me on social media or you can email me at podcastwigu at gmail.com. Um, all right. Thanks, Esther. I appreciate your time again. Thank you so much, Blair. It was so nice talking with you. And thank you for the opportunity. You're doing a really amazing thing. And oh. um, yeah, you're, you're helping to, to, to change lives. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Thank you for saying that. I'm so encouraged by, by you and all of my guests every, every time I meet with you guys. So thanks again. Thanks, guys, for listening. Until next time. Bye. Bye-bye.